So it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Duckworth. Dr. Duckworth is the Chief Medical Officer of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, and has worked with NAMI since 2003. He's board certified in adult psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry, is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He was previously acting commissioner and medical director at the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. He's worked on an assertive community treatment team at an early psychosis program, at an elementary school, at a health plan, and with people who are unhoused. His passion for this work comes from his loving father, who had bipolar disorder. Ken lives with his family in Boston, and he is going to be speaking with us today about his work with NAMI. Please uh, give a warm welcome to Dr. Duckworth. Thank you, Chris. It's really nice to be here. Uh, I've had many people have great care here at McLean over my years uh, traveling. I practice in Boston my entire career. And I want to thank Chris for inviting me. I'm inviting Chris to share his work and his book with the NAMI community in our Ask the Expert session, which is a good example of how NAMI has become uh, an integrative force with psychiatry. It's important to understand the National Alliance on Mental Illness was initially formed in opposition to psychiatry. A uh, few of you with gray hair may recall that psychiatry once blamed parents and mothers in particular for their children's psychosis, particularly schizophrenia. So NAMI begins as a group in opposition to psychiatry. And uh, this is a critical form because the schizophrenogenic mother theory uh, was quite popular in the 70s. At the same time, state hospitals were closing. So a group of mothers got together. We call them NAMI mommies. Uh, they got together and they said, you know, I wonder if it's not only about us. Many of them had three or four healthy children and one child with a psychotic illness and said if it really was our parenting style, our being cold or refrigerator mothers, that might be the central feature, but it doesn't seem that that's quite accurate. So they formed uh, around a kitchen table in 1979, uh, in part uh, in opposition to psychiatry. But the first thing that happened in our journey is they became great allies in research. Because you all knew Sherv Prazier, a leader here at McLean. He was the director of the National Institute of Mental Health and had never heard of NAMI. Uh, in a book that I wrote, I wrote NAMI's first book, and I'll tell you about it, I interviewed the executive director during that period of time. And she said, I tried to meet with Sherv Frazier and he didn't know who NAMI was. And so I told NAMI members in the then 40 or 50 affiliates, we have about 750 now across the country. When Sherv Frazier comes to town, ask him what he's doing for research from people with serious mental illness. So NAMI essentially becomes the natural partner. And NAMI helped to double the NIMH budget in the 90s, the so-called decade of the brain. And this was the first kind of advocacy triumph of NAMI that was integrative. So let's see how I do with your slides here. Not that well. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. That one, yeah, I, you think I could have done that. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to let you know, NAMI's doing a lot of things. Now I want to share a few of them with you, just so you have a good idea of what's happening before I tell you about NAMI's first book. Um, there's a national NAMI helpline. We have 150 volunteers, people with lived experience. This is first person experience and family experience. They take calls from people all over America, about 75,000 calls, texts, and chat. Uh, it's really the, not, the largest helpline that is not the National Crisis Lifeline. NAMI Massachusetts has a very similar uh, activity for people that are lost and can't find help here in Massachusetts, staffed by volunteers again. So I want to tell you a little bit about NAMI. NAMI used to be broke, and I used to donate all my travel for NAMI as I would go around to meet with people. And then Mackenzie Scott found us. You might know Mackenzie Scott as the uh, greatest philanthropist now in American history. And uh, she scoped us out and gave us a $30 million grant. So this means NAMI will be here long after we're all gone. Uh, it's quite remarkable. In addition to that, individual donations have exploded. They're up about 200% over the last three years. Um, we've grown to another 100 and 135 employees at the national office. So I work and live in Boston but I work at the national office. I'm the national chief medical officer. And uh, if you are interested, we have a program for providers 
uh, and hospitals in education where people with lived experience come and share what they've learned. Uh, this is happening in all the medical schools in Iowa. And I went to meet with them and it was a lot of fun. So what I can tell you now is this is just another example of how NAMI is growing. I think it was fair to criticize NAMI 15 years ago as taking money from pharma. Uh, pharma now is a single digit contributor to NAMI and only pays for educational programs. Doesn't have anything to do with our advocacy. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit about our advocacy. You've heard of the number 988. Uh, that's NAMI's work. And uh, we spent a lot of life force making sure that there was a short, quick number for people to call to access what is now the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, it does not create the mobile care services that are culturally responsive and thoughtful. That's the next job. The next job is to create the conditions where people across America can get mobile crisis access. We're not there yet. We're working on it. That's our next job. Coordinated specialty care, Dost Unger is a leader in this entire movement of the early psychosis movement. Dost is a great friend to NAMI. We happen to love Dost. Um, NAMI advocated for that money to be in the federal block grant. And the idea would be that that wouldn't be money that was floating and uh, subject to uh, problems. It would be structured into the federal block grants to states. So the Coordinated Specialty Care Program, which now has close to 300 programs across America, uh, and a, a good number in Massachusetts. Uh, you can thank NAMI for the advocacy. We had a bunch of people who experienced some of the early programs that we went to Congress. And we spent a lot of time advocating and making it really clear that this was a bipartisan issue, that intervening early in a preventive public health strategy would be a beneficial outcome. Uh, we've done a lot of work on the first person voice in advocacy. And this is why I knew I could write a book where real people would use their names. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the book journey as I get to that. Uh, Mental Health Parity 1.0, I think nobody would really agree that we have true parity. Half a psychiatrist take no insurance. Many clinicians are grossly underpaid. Peer specialists are not particularly supported in many states across the country. And uh, until we have out-of-network payment for radiology and cardiovascular procedures, I don't think we'll really have said that we have mental health parity. Until it, mental health practitioners accept insurance, that the payment is actually adequate. I did a fellowship with Brad at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. I've been part-time for NAMI the whole time. And while I was able to raise child psychiatry rates by $100 a session, I wasn't able to really move a large cadre of people to the health plans. I think because health plans have also managed to create the conditions that pe periodically they audit people and cause people difficulty. And so in a mental health parity 2.0, which NAMI is working on, this would get right to the essence of payment equivalence to the market, not to a primary care person. So uh, I think it's really important uh, to remember Mental Health Parity 1.0 uh, stopped people from making quantitative limits. So back in the day, 100 years ago, I had a private practice when I was the medical director. I walked across the street uh, from the Department of Mental Health headquarters and I saw patients and you had $500 a year in outpatient services for Blue Cross. This is in the 90s. This isn't the 1890s, this is the 1990s, right? I wanna emphasize this and you had two hospitalizations a year and you are not allowed to use more than that. And Brad and I occasionally in our travels at Blue Cross ran across a person, you know, from a union contract which hadn't been re-upped where you would find that they still only had two or three admissions a year for a detox or uh, a psychiatric admission when of course they had unlimited access to cardiac, diabetes, uh, and infectious disease care. So this was mental health parity 1.0. 1.0 is you couldn't have quantitative limits upon mental health and addiction for health plans. That was a success, but it's not the same as having reimbursement equity because we still have the problem of so many psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers are rationally making decisions to reject payment. So uh, it's a fundamental problem and we are working on that uh, with the APA and some other groups. I want to tell you a little bit about what NAMI is doing in research. 
Have any of you heard of the AMP Schizophrenia Project? All right, so this is one of our, our best little uh, things we've cooked up. Uh, Steve Hyman wrote an editorial in Science Magazine in 2014 that said, how on earth could schizophrenia not have an AMP? The AMP is the Accelerated Medicines Partnership funded by the Foundation for NIH. And what AMP does is it takes interested professionals, academicians, and people from pharma to participate in a multi-year project for preclinical biological discovery. So it's pre-competitive. And you try to identify what are the uh, events. So uh, I called Steve Hyman after reading his article. We got together uh, with about seven people. Notably, the director of translational research came up to Boston for the first meeting in 2014. And in 2019, the FNIH awarded $100 million uh, to an AMP schizophrenia. It's the first accelerated medicine partnership for a major mental illness. So AMP exists for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for Parkinson's disease. There are other illness processes that they're still looking for more biological targets. But this was a tremendous triumph. And uh, we're now having a meeting with NIMH for what should be next. Should there be an AMP for bipolar disorder? should be an amp for the prevention of suicide. The project has really been shaped by Linda Brady and Carlos Lurai. Lurai. Uh, Carlos is a NAMI former board member who lives with schizophrenia. And he and Linda run this program. And what we're trying to do is identify the biological markers that are found in people who convert to psychosis. We don't have good biological markers, as you all know. And this is our opportunity to uh, work that problem. So five pharma companies put up money, a NAMI donor put up a million dollars, uh, that basically this $100 million is largely FNIH money, but many other industries have uh, been part of it. And uh, we're really proud uh, that our Carlos from NAMI is co-leading uh, this entire endeavor. We consider research critical and sure, Fraser did, in fact, meet with NAMI. And he got to love NAMI and saw the natural partners of people who wanted to do research on serious mental illness so they wouldn't be blamed. And it has now, over time, evolved into what I would describe as a beautiful relationship between NIMH and NAMI. Every year, I invite the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, now Josh Gordon, to come to the NAMI convention, wherever it is. I usually pick uh, a week to have the convention that. Josh is on vacation, I have found. So the way my new current rubric is to ask Josh when he's on vacation so he can do grand rounds from Thailand. That would be the most common uh, rubric. But he comes and he talks to the members. And uh, you know, how many chances do you get to talk to the director of the National Institute of Mental Health? Well, we've been doing this for 20 years now. So this, again, illustrates the idea that NAMI began in opposition to psychiatry. And now we are completely simpatico and an integrative force. I'll just tell you my own little story in this regard. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got involved in NAMI. So my dad had very bad bipolar disorder and was a very loving person. And uh, I interviewed, I was very naive in 1986. I explained this in my essay for why I wanted to become a psychiatrist. I didn't realize that I had violated an unwritten rule. Uh, this was ignored at every program across America. And I'm talking Stanford, UCSF, you know, NYU, Duke, you know, people would read my essay. My essay was, I'm going to become a psychiatrist to make sense of what happened to my father who was loving and periodically psychotic. This is my motivation for doing this. And uh, just to give you some insight into how we got into an opposition space, uh, I was told that um, my rationale for becoming a psychiatrist was a terrible reason by a famous psychoanalyst. Uh, I left that facility, went into the parking lot, and put my head on the uh, dashboard. And I realized that my essay had been ignored at 10 different facilities. Nobody asked me one question about it. And people asked me about my volunteer work, medical stuff. I went to the University of Michigan, so many jumped in on college football. You know, very happy topics, and I was admitted to some, not all of these programs. 
But my reason for becoming a psychiatrist was universally ignored. I just found it so amazing. Uh, after the psychoanalyst told me that it was a terrible reason to become a psychiatrist, to have a loved one with a major mental illness, you know, as I mentioned, I went to my car, put my head on the steering wheel, and thought, I'm going to have to do cardiology. I actually don't think this is going to work for me. They seem to drive nicer cars, back to mental health parity. So maybe a BMW and cardiology. I liked cardiology. I, I, talking to people about their hearts and helping them seemed almost as good as this journey into the unknown. So I asked the world famous psychoanalyst what would be a good reason to become a psychiatrist. And I was 26 year old, I wasn't the commissioner of mental health, I wasn't board certified, I was a kid. And I don't think anybody had ever asked this famous person a question like that. And he paused for quite a long time. And then he said, well I think if your father is a psychiatrist that would be a good reason. So that was the low moment of my entire career. This person was not thinking of the workforce shortage that we have. I'm a psychiatrist with three daughters, two of whom are in medical school. Neither of them are going to become a, a psychiatrist. I'm happy to report, like, they should live their life. And uh, one of them is very happy. She teaches English in Madrid. So um, two med students and one happy child is what I'd say. So this illustrates, this is 1986. This is seven years after NAMI forms. I picked up on some of this cultural problem, the cultural problem that I wanted to understand what it was like for people from an experience point of view. So it doesn't surprise you that I started to volunteer for NAMI. They're very interested in the first person experience, the family experience. Again, NAMI starts out as a family group for families by families in opposition to psychiatry who is blaming them. The 90s bring you the synthesis of we're partners in research with NIMH. And uh, then they decided to become uh, the largest group of people with mental health conditions. So they have an elected board, and they made a decision not to be a family-only organization. You might not know that in Europe, there's UFAMI and there's GAMI, and it's two different groups. And I think it's very interesting that in America, we take on the added tension and stress of having people from both the first-person experience and the family experience in the room at the same time. So I can join them all by getting them to fight for mental health parity, and I can divide them all by mentioning the words assisted outpatient treatment. And it's easy to know, it's easy to see. It's the complexity that we have in the states that they don't have in Europe. They don't have it. You know, UFAMI fights for things that are for the families. Gamian is the name of the first person experience. NAMI's the largest group in the world, and there's really no group like it. Let me show you the kind of programs we run. This is just a good example. Uh, and I'll just give you a few examples here. Uh, where to start? Uh, let's do NAMI family to family down here in the right corner. Um, that's the first original group. Joyce Berlin, a psychologist, blamed uh, by her psychiatrist for her uh, sister's uh, psychosis, and then blamed when her daughter developed psychosis. Joyce was like, I think the families might be able to teach each other anything. And of course, it won't surprise you that in the late 80s, early 90s, again, this is not long after I was told it was a terrible thing to go into psychiatry because of a family member. She said, you know, I think we could teach each other. And the professionals were very against this. Joyce uh, shouldered on and got some families together in Vermont. And to make a long story short, created a program, which is 12 weeks or 10 weeks, depending on what version you're dealing with Lisa Dixon now of Columbia, studied at the University of Maryland, and she did a randomized control trial of people on a wait list and people who got the service. And the families who got the service had increased hope and increased empowerment, and their family members didn't get better. So it wasn't like the family program was helping the individuals with psychotic illnesses. The families felt more hoped and empowered. Uh, when Lisa Dixon and her colleagues followed up, uh, nine months later, all the same results applied. So all the, all the findings stuck all that time. So just to give you a couple other ideas, ending the silence up here on the left is our fastest growing program. This was invented by a mother in Illinois who had a child with a serious mental health condition who was being bullied in, her, in his uh, junior high school. And she went to the local district and said, could we do an educational program where people with mental health conditions say, if you have symptom A, symptom B, symptom D, 
you might be experiencing a mental health condition. And by the way, Joe from Counseling is here to talk to you. So ending the silence is now in thousands of school districts across America. It is by far the fastest growing program. It is taught by people with lived experience and a teacher. And so programs had been conceptualized as programs for teachers. And uh, Brenda Hillegas is like, yeah, no. We need this for the students. Each individual school district functions on its own, as you might uh, know in America. Each PTA, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, getting anything in a curriculum. And uh, it's our wildly, it's the fastest growing program by far. It's a good example because both Joyce, who developed family to family, saw a need. We could support each other. You don't have to be alone. Brenda was like, this has to change for kids in junior high school and high school. The most common forms of disability and vulnerability in junior high and high schools are, of course, mental health and addiction. They're not vision and, you know, other health issues, right? Hearing, vision, the things we like to check for and talk about. Mental health and addiction, of course, are the primary drivers of bad outcomes, including not uh, graduating from high school. Uh, it's the most commonly associated uh, uh, illness vulnerability. NAMI in our own voice, I just want to identify that. This is something you can have at McLean or anywhere else. You can have people for free will show up. We get grants for all this stuff and talk about their own recovery journey. And of course, there's a pretty good literature. Pat Corrigan uh, from Illinois has shown that if you meet people with mental health conditions, you're less likely to have negative attitudes about it. So we run fewer ads at 4 a.m. on WBUR than we used to. We've really gotten more into in-person contact, meeting people, meeting people uh, in person. This is how I knew we could write a book with first-person experience as the core, because I had been to so many of these. And so when I wrote NAMI's first book proposal uh, two years ago, um, I got five publishers to bid on the book, but one of them said, you can't get real people to use their names. And I said, you haven't been hanging around NAMI very much, have you? So uh, Simon & Schuster is not my friend. And I just thought it was interesting to me that somehow this idea that real people exist in book, could exist in a book with their names, who they are, and what they had learned was so radical. Um, I did have a limited symptom panic experience. I went to Brookline Booksmith and I started to read the acknowledgments. This is now after I've interviewed 130 people. I've done 160 hours of interviews. I've reviewed their transcripts. I've pulled out the best quotes from them. I've sent them the quotes. And I'm like, how do you write acknowledgments? I'm a rookie author. I've got gray hair. Never did this before. And every book has a variation on the patients in this book are, not, are my greatest teachers. There will be no names. Any associations to people real or imagined is made up because people are talking about their patients. They have to respect HIPAA. These aren't my patients. These are my people. This is my community. So I had this advantage of flipping the whole thing on its head. I did have a lot of anxiety because it seemed kind of countercultural. I called my academic chairman, Maturi Keshavan, also a leader in the early psychosis movement. I said, Kesh, I just want to let you know, you know, I'm kind of going out on a limb here. I'm going to let people use their names and say what they've learned. And I was bracing for the worst. And he said, Ken, ours is a culture that needs to change. And I thought, well, didn't I hit the jackpot with having Maturi Keshavan as my chairman in academics? All these programs are available. All these programs will come to you. If you send me an email, I'm ken at nami.org and say we want to have NAMI provider. We want to have in our own voice here at McLean Hospital. You may have some of these because you're a forward thinking uh, hospital that has done a lot of good. Uh, just send me an email and we'll connect. Sharing your story with law enforcement is our ability to participate in crisis intervention training. CIT is something, wait for it, invented by NAMI by two mothers whose children were recurrently arrested in Memphis, Tennessee for um, loitering, for urinating in public. And then in Memphis, T, a man with a, Memphis, Tennessee, a man with a mental illness was uh, barricaded in his home and the police killed him. And this activated the whole idea of could we have prevention and an upstream training approach so the police officers could respond with de-escalation, not with their guns drawn. 
Again, tsunami mothers, again, the story's over and over again. You want to change the world, you get people who really care about this. Major Sam Cochran uh, took this on, has become a national treasure in the training of police officers. It's interesting, Massachusetts, which will tell you we're all about being leaders, I've certainly heard that once or twice, perhaps you have, was one of the last states to adopt crisis intervention training. I'm happy to say NAMI Massachusetts, my colleagues took this on and have gotten it into most of the 351 towns. But each police officer, each police leader, each department has to say, how do I pay for 40 hours of time for them to be trained? I have to make a decision. This is like getting into the Harvard Medical School curriculum. You have to give up time for some other requirement. So uh, what we found is that every county in Ohio, except one, does crisis intervention training. It just tells you a little bit about the nature of peer pressure. It has limitations. One person has just decided, my officers are fine. We don't need this. So CIT, sharing your stories with law enforcement, is just another great example of uh, the kind of work we're doing. NAMI Connection up there on the right uh, is a support group that people can go to in an ongoing way. NAMI Basics is for parents of younger children who have serious mental health conditions. That's an online program because if you have young kids, you can't show up at a Lutheran church basement. Again, randomized controlled trial shown it's been helpful to people. So I did mention this earlier. Uh, this is how the NAMI family to family is really the idea of service to science. So you've all heard of science to service. Scientists develop amazing things and it takes 17 years to get into the world. There are things that are being invented in the world that are then studied by research. NIMH put up $2 million for this and we're forever grateful to prove that a uh, homegrown program could be of help. You can find this all across America in person and on Zoom for free. Uh, so let me tell you about the little book I decided to write. So I thought the largest mental health group in America should have its book. And uh, I could tell you the publishers weren't ready five years ago and NAMI wasn't ready five years ago. Uh, I was told people aren't interested in our story. Nobody would want to buy this book. Uh, internally and externally, but I'd been working on it for about 15 years because I realized that I had learned something having a dad with severe bipolar disorder. I realized that you could form a loving relationship, but what I didn't know is all the other things that other families had learned. How to communicate better. We never quite figured that out. I wanted to talk to other families that learned how to communicate. People who were integrated into their identity and got into recovery and got into helping other people with it. These were the things that I always felt was missing. When I was at Brookline Booksmith, my local bookstore, there'd be 100 memoirs, interesting but not practical, and 100 textbooks, which few people read. How do I know that? Every time I write a chapter on involving the family, nobody's ever said to me, Ken, that chapter was a real bodice ripper. I loved your chapter, it was fantastic. It's changed my life. You know, I'm feeling like I wanted a book that was the synthesis of the first person and family lessons and uh, the best of research, uh, easily translated for people. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So this is our book, You Are Not Alone. It's uh, evidence-based research. Uh, I asked Josh Gordon and many other people really common questions that I get. And uh, many people from the Harvard system, I'll name a few of them at the end. And then I had 130 people share their real names. So there's a man named Trevor McCauley who lives in Michigan. He dropped out of the University of Michigan after getting manic. How did Trevor assemble his life again? Well, you can learn that in the book. And Trevor will be a resource to you. Send me an email, I'll connect you to Trevor. Trevor loves doing this. It has transformed his life. I've done book tours all across America. And when I was in Ann Arbor, not far from where Trevor lives, his wife came up to me and said, Trevor's been waiting a whole year for this day. And he brought his whole family. It was quite beautiful. There's about seven people from his family. And he said, I want them to know what I'm doing with what I've been dealt. It was a beautiful example of that. I just got an email, I got a grant uh, from a family. So if any of you wanna buy a book, I will also send you a book if you wanna. So it's a buy one, give one opportunity. A family liked this book 
and just sent me a check for $20,000 to give away some books. So we sold about 27,000 books. We made a couple best of lists. The book's been translated into Chinese. We don't have it in Spanish yet. It's been rewritten for the United Kingdom. Uh, I, I'm calling it You Are Not Alone with Scones. That's the tentative title. So uh, how do you get a book with real people? Because this is actually, I think, the thing that's somewhat radical. If you have gray hair, you might know Stud Sterkel. If you're a young person, you might know Humans of New York. When I put the book proposal together, I said, this is Humans of New York, but it's Humans of Mental Health. And uh, if you're into the Studs Terkel version, it's working with a mental health condition. Uh, he um, was a pioneer and one of my original inspirations. When I read that book, I thought, I was always thinking about how that could be integrated into my little professional life. So basically, I got an IRB approved, so I wasn't hurting people. It seemed like a good idea for my uh, interview protocol. Uh, I had an extensive informed consent discussion with each and every volunteer, and this is before they got the form. And I said, I want you to know this is a completely different book. Your name is Diana Chow. You're an immigrant from China. You developed, you know, a psychosis and a suicide attempt. You then started the largest teen to teen mental health support system in the world. If you don't want to tell that story, it's okay. Ken, I need to tell this story. It's fantastic and I want to use my name. I ran into a few people who were like, oh my gosh, can I tell my story without using my name? I said, not for this book. The whole point is shame and isolation have been such central features of mental health. I wanted you to be able to find someone like you in this book, and that was quite intentional. So what I did is uh, I gave people about five ways to get out of doing this, and uh, I actually interviewed one whole person, and at the end she said, you're not going to use my name, are you? And I said, got great news for you. I'm going to eliminate this entire conversation. But all 130 other people, I said, I'm going to send you the transcripts. You can review the transcripts. If there's anything you don't want in the book, let me know. Just cross it out. It's no problem. Because there's so many lessons in what people have learned. And then what I did is I sent people transcripts. Here's the quote that I think is the most compelling of what you have. And I have now another grant. I'm doing audio recordings. This will live as a little podcast. So if you're interested in James Ramirez, how he healed his relationship with his son, uh, he used the Etch-a-Sketch metaphor that he had written out an entire Etch-a-Sketch of how their lives would be together. You know, he had, he's a very visual thinker. Uh, and he went to these family to family classes and realized he had to let his son run his own life. He hands the son the Etch-a-Sketch and he says, here, shake it up and you tell me what do you want our life to be, your life to be, and how can I help you? So that's a quote from James Ramirez. I happen to love that quote, but I'm gonna get it so you can listen to the interview if you're interested in him. You know, I'll have a new informed consent process, the law review, uh, they're gonna work off the Zoom interviews that I've already done. And that's a grant that I just got. And the idea is that lived experience is expertise, that you've actually learned something. If you've lived with bipolar disorder for 30 years, it's possible you might have picked something up. Of course you still need professionals. Of course you still need all those other things. But it's also possible we could learn from each other. So this was, uh, I think, what makes the book a little bit different than other books that are out there. These are the screenshots of people that I interviewed all along the way. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, experience. COVID happened, uh, and I realized that people were now asking me to be on CNN, not to talk about the relationship between mental illness and mass murder, but what helped people connect, what helped people get better. This is when I realized that NAMI could, in fact, have a book. And so I put out a feeler to the CEO who was new, and he said, let's go. And then I sent emails out to the NAMI community. Anybody want to be in the book? Tell your story. I didn't screen them. I figured if I interviewed 50 people, I get so into it, I kept going. So you'll see all the pictures uh, of the people here. That woman's second box on the right is the last person who was alive at the first NAMI convention in 1979. She has since passed away. She was the first in person I interviewed. She was 100 years old. The day I got the book deal, I'm like, let's find Eleanor Owen. Let's just track her right down, because she's the last person to the original route, which is important. And these are families uh, and individuals from all across America. 
I'll tell you a little bit more about them. As I mentioned, there's 130 interviews with individuals living with the experience and family members. Again, this is a both-end book. This is kind of where NAMI's at. Several people advised me to write one book for families and one book for individuals with lived experience, more the Euro model. And I'm like, no, 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 no. The whole idea is integration, that you could actually learn something from watching the people who are living with this. And if you're living with it, you could actually learn what the families are dealing with and what they're afraid of. So that was the idea. I also got some of the best researchers in America to answer all the common questions I get at NAMI. And all proceeds go to NAMI. It's a love gift. I gave NAMI the copyright. I really wanted NAMI to have a book. I just felt unconscionable to me that the largest mental health group in the world didn't have a book. And so I'm happy to say we're in 3,000 libraries. Montana just sent me an email yesterday. They're buying one for all 62 libraries in Montana. How cute is that? All 18 colleges. I mean, just heartbreakingly adorable. I gave a little virtual talk, and Montana's buying 100 books. I mean, how sweet is that? Michigan is buying 700 books, one for every high school in the state of Michigan. So what you find is interesting things happen when you uh, find people you know, who want to talk about things. Uh, if this was a uh, electoral college, uh, NAMI would have won in a landslide. I got people from 38 states, from Cape Cod to Hawaii. Of course I went to Hawaii for a book event. I'm no fool. I, uh, uh, Anchorage to San Antonio. I've been to Anchorage and I'm going to San Antonio in a couple weeks. And what I do on the panels and the book events is the people in the book from that state are on the stage with me. And they share why they wanted to be in the book, why they wanted to use their names, what they hope people get. Then they all sign the book with me. It's really been quite a beautiful experience. 11 self-identified race and ethnicities. When you're writing a book like this, you have to have the people tell you who they are. 12 people have said they were black. 12 said they were African American. One man looked black and identified as Jewish. I didn't can change that. Uh, he had grown up in foster care, and the Jewish home was the only home that he wasn't mistreated in. So his identity is not as a black man, but as a Jewish man. And I just thought, this life is so interesting. So people told me who they were. Some are cisgendered. Some, I mean, some identify their religious affiliation. Some don't. It was completely um, self-identified. They made no efforts to change, correct, interrupt, offer my suggestions of uh, who they might be. Uh, across the gender uh, and sexuality spectrums, People self-identified 25 different faith orientations, 50 different occupations, doctors, carpenters, CEOs, people who've been homeless, people on disability, people who've been incarcerated. Uh, ages 16 to 100, one woman reported that she was, quote, old as dirt. And that's not the 100-year-old woman, so it's possible that she is even a little older. So uh, this is the book, and again, I'm happy to send you one. If you want to buy one, just send me an email. If you want to put one in Waverly Place or the McLean Hospital Library, you know, I'll just mail you a couple. Uh, you're going to buy a couple. I'll send you a couple. It's been really fun. Uh, and uh, I try to review kind of the big picture of what we know and what we don't know. An alternative title for the book was The People's Guide to Mental Health. I wanted to lay out what we knew and what we didn't know. I had smart people. Uh, review every single chapter. Part two is simply interviews with people. Themes of recovery. What are the common elements that people identify in their own recovery journey? The power of peers. One of the greatest lessons from this entire experience was how strong a peer is in terms of people's healing. Someone like you. Culture and identity. People talked about uh, being told to pray it away in their church, people talked about discrimination, people having not the same language as them, and how to become an advocate. And in part three, the family communication, which my family did fail at in spite of the fact that it was loving, I was very interested in how families worked the problem to talk about it. Navigating the legal system, obviously a big issue for families. The hardest family question, so these are the things that I've been challenged the most with at NAMI. What do you do when the person has a lack of awareness of illness? They have anosognosia. What do you do about that? Uh, making meaning of loss by suicide. I interviewed uh, eight people who lost family members who died by suicide. I wanted the book to be real as opposed to nice. 
And in interviewing 130 volunteers, it turns out people turn up who've been through this. How do they make meaning of their lives? I interviewed two people who founded the Jed Foundation, the largest college and university suicide prevention program on planet Earth. They lost their son Jed at Arizona State University. They met with the president, and the president said, what would you have me do? I have 35,000 students. And they left the room and they said, that's a really good question. Why don't we call together all the best researchers in America and work the problem? And so the Jed Foundation is one good example of people who've tried to take that loss and make meaning of it. They told me that they routinely get phone calls where someone will say, I lost my son at Georgia Tech. I want to fund the Jed Foundation prevention program for every university in the state of Georgia. People are continuously trying to make meaning of loss. In part four, I asked America's uh, researchers all across the country uh, to uh, answer these common questions. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of whom they are. I just want to call out John Torres. He's a Harvard guy. Uh, Marlene Friedman, I want to have a baby, but I live with bipolar disorder. Uh, Andy Nirenberg, do I really have to take these meds forever? Um, Kesh, um, Achiri Keshavan, is there a better way to approach early psychosis? What is the best approach to OCD, Sabine Wilhelm? I just contacted people all across the country. They weren't all academicians. Mary Ellen Copeland invented the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. Very few people seem to know about uh, that in the world. Bob Drake invented the idea of supported employment. He's a semi-retired man. I felt I wanted to get a few of these legends into the book uh, so that people could understand that. William Miller over here on the family side, he invented motivational interviewing, which is one of the most critical skills on planet Earth that very few people seem to know about. So I asked Bill Miller to discuss, you know, how do you get somebody to, to get help? How do you convince someone to get help? And it's not what you think. You don't say to them, you're depressed and you need help. Bill Miller says that's going to activate the writing reflex where you push on this side of the boat and they push right back at you. So these are all people that I wanted uh, to have in the book. And this is just a shout out to the people in the McLean MGH larger Harvard system. Although, as you can see, I have people from all over America who answer these questions. Uh, these are the names of the 130 people who are my lived experience experts. Uh, I celebrate them all across America. And uh, I'm going to stop there. It uh, looks like it's uh, 1248. So we have time for some questions and conversation. And again, I am Ken. I work for NAMI, Ken at NAMI.org. And I just got this $20,000 grant. If you want to buy a book, just send me an email and an address, and I'll mail it to you or to some place that you want a book to go to. You know, a hospital library, an emergency room, a friend, you tell me. So we just started that. Today's the first day I'm announcing that. Target's gonna feature the book in all 2,000 stores. Uh, fun things are happening. Uh, it's been fun to be right that NAMI needed a book. It was a good idea after all, and I'll probably never write another one. NAMI uh, has a second book coming out. It's a guide for parents of children and teenagers. And it's being written by my associate medical director, Christine Crawford. Chris, I'm sure you know about writing a book. For some of us, it's a one-off. One of my favorite Spotify playlists is now One Hit Wonders. And I think that's going to be my so-called book career. It turns out there's some fantastic One Hit Wonders. I just want you to know that. And I think that's going to be my legacy, is that NAMI will have a line of books. So many people have said to me, if only I knew about NAMI 10 years ago. It's heartbreaking. I'll meet people on an airplane. NAMI saved my marriage. You know, to me, I just wanted to make it easy for people. Uh, in my dinky little, I have a little shack on Cape Cod, in my dinky little library in Sandwich, Massachusetts, I went and I asked for my own little book and there were three people who had signed up for it and I had to wait. And I thought, my work here is done. That's all I wanted was for people to not have to learn about this until it was too late for them. So Chris, again, I want to thank you for this invitation. It's very generous of you to have me, you know, at NAMI and uh, to tell you a little bit about our work. And I'm happy to engage in a conversation, take questions. I don't know if this is something you do online or I'll let you take it from here, Chris.
We'll see if anybody in the room has questions. Yep, good. I don't know if you remember me, but we were old buddies back in the mass mental days. Yes, but you're hidden behind a mask now. Yes, yay. So I remember during that time, I spoke with you about my own dilemma. Yes. Of being a person who lived with mental illness. Yes. In those days, you couldn't, you couldn't come out of the closet. People yes. were uh, really awful. Mental health professionals were by far. Was it the, this is in the, the early worst. 90s, so I was a rookie there. I was a youngster. Yes. I was asked this question at Des Moines University by three medical students as they were looking towards their residency. Should I discuss my own history of bipolar disorder, my mother died by suicide, my own eating disorder? And I said, you may get the same reception that I did, or you might stumble onto someone like me. And I can't tell you. So my advice to you would be to get into the residency of your choice, suss out the culture, and then demonstrate what you can do, and then share your experience. But you might decide to lead with it, which was a catastrophic error on my part in 1986. Only one person across America, Ned Hallowell at Mass Mental Health Center, said, hey, this is great. You could, you could, you've known more than other people. It turns out his dad had bipolar disorder. And so he was the only person who was ready. So yes, I'm afraid we still have work to do. Right. Do you so, think it's improved in oh, the mental health field? it's improved. So I hid for many years. Um, I'm much more open about it now. Yeah. Um, but it's still problematic sometimes. Yes. And it's also, you know, being a peer is now a profession, right? So yes. That wasn't available to me that back, wasn't available. back in the day. Yeah. The other thing I want to say is, so I, I live, have my own lived experience. I'm a family member. Yes. I'm an advocate. I do a lot of things. And what I want to say by far, being a family member is without a doubt the worst, worst situation to be in. It is mm. horrible to be a family member even when you're a mental health professional, yeah. how other you know, mental health professionals uh, try to close the family out. And certainly HIPAA hasn't helped with that. Right. So, so the, the family member pain, you're saying the primary pain is the professionals box you out. Yes. And this is part of the origin of why NAMI developed all these programs. And they're rude. Let me just face it, they're rude. They're There's rude. A lot of rudeness that comes in the mental you're... health professionals. Yes, when you're so, a family member and you're trapped. And like, I could have written a chapter called "Horrible Things Mental Health Practitioners Have Said to Me." Right. I, right, I want you exactly. to know that. But I want mental health practitioners to buy this book. I want to get this into medical schools. And so I didn't want to say all of that in the themes <laughs> of recovery. <laughs> I did have a section called "Don't Believe a Negative Prognosis." And I had three people who were told they would never make anything of themselves. They should never have a relationship. They were going to need a custodian. I just picked three random ones. And I said, all these people are now thriving. One through DBT, one through medication and peer support. Um, and uh, I can't recall the third. They were all doing well 10 years later. And what I said was basically, don't believe a negative prognosis. Like, don't let that define you. Professionals are really smart. But we're not that good at looking down the road. No, no. That's a limitation we have. We know a lot, and we should be proud of what we know and the service we so, deliver. The, right? other, the other thing I wanted to say, which is a particular um, irritant to myself, is <coughs> that NAMI Massachusetts, unlike most of the other NAMIs across the United States, does not support AOT. Right. And I've always had a big issue with that. I've had a lot of fights with a lot of my friends who are peers. And yeah. So. A part of it, I think, is because they take it to be something about them, yeah. rather than talking about a right. sub, sub, sub group of people. So, so what I think, how I handled AOT, which is a great controversy, is I found a man who AOT saved his life. And Eric Smith is going to be on the panel with me in Texas in three weeks. And uh, he basically felt that AOT saved his life. And the quote that I have from him is, AOT court order treatment was not the most coercive thing in my own life. The most coercive thing was an untreated psychotic illness that was killing me. And I said, Eric Smith, you're my guy. And my position on this is a tiny number of people benefit from this. And it should not be, the book is a very recovery focused book. A lot of people don't need this. There's a small percentage of people for whom it can be life saving. If you look at the national NAMI platform, we say it should be the last tool in the toolkit. It should not be used as a substitute for not having access to services, right? The man for whom Kendra's Law 
was named, was on three wait lists at clinics in New York City, and would probably not have been eligible for Kendra's Law. I just want to emphasize, even AOT is not a fix. So yes, I do disagree with my colleagues here at NAMI Massachusetts. I work for the National Office in DC and have lived the dysfunctional life of living in Roslindale and hopping airplanes for the last 20 years to go to meetings in DC. Before the pandemic, I actually got to know flight attendants by their first names. I was such a regular on the shuttle, but that's kind of, you know, now it's all past. So, but thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you feel it's getting better. I feel it's getting better too. I don't think this book was possible to have written 10 years ago or even five years ago. I think the pandemic created an audience for NAMI's first person leadership. I think that's kind of my little synthesis for it. So Ken. Um, hey Brad. Good to see you again. Um, I wonder, despite what you've said, it seems to me that there is a real uh, problem with access to care. Absolutely. And, and is, uh, is NAMI doing anything to advocate strategies to try to change that, so like, like training more people, et cetera? So uh, we don't do professionals, but you know, NAMI doesn't make professionals, and we don't keep professional lists of people we like, because having sat on the peer review board at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, one-tenth of one percent of people are losing their license at all times for terrible things they've done. And you can't have a list of people who, you know, would do that. So now he's trying to drive the workforce through the peer angle. So we would say, why is in every state like Georgia, where peers are certified and paid for by insurance plans, by Medicaid? So that's what we would bring to the table. We would be bringing new players onto the field. The, a the APA not having enough psychiatry spots in a field that's booming. Psychiatry is now cool. I want to emphasize this. I got two medical students in my life. Psychiatry is cool. It's interesting. It's compelling. You have time with patients. It's the brain. It's science. Like psychiatry was not cool, you know, in 86. I had my own journey for it. So that's what NAMI is doing. I'm not sure there is a good answer for the workforce challenge. I think if we're successful with mental health parity 2.0, the number of psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and clinicians that are on the sidelines not accepting insurance would grow, right? So they're just serving the top 5% of income as it stands now. So it's a great question, Brad. We do need more people on the field. I think bringing uh, the peers is where NAMI is going to be focusing its efforts. But there is an access crisis. I'm not going to ever deny that. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for your really inspiring talk and yeah, yeah. Um, all your incredible work. Um, my name is Ann Shin. I'm a psychiatrist here. And yeah, yeah. Um, I also teach medical students. Um, I'm a course director for the Introduction to Clinical Psychiatry course at Harvard, MIT, Health Sciences and Technology. And um, HST. HST, exactly. Uh, and I, um, I did it for many years at Mass Mental Health Center. Oh, wonderful. Very happy. So, yeah. So, um, actually, um, on January 18th, which is you know next week, we have a panel of lived experience experts who are going to come and teach the medical students. These are second year medical students um, about their experiences with Fantastic. mental illness and recovery. And you know, I am putting together a um, a reference list, a bibliography. Yeah for students to learn more about, you know, yeah. how they can learn, and I'm gonna put your book on there, so Yay. I'm um, really excited to hear this talk just prior to that, Fantastic. and I will definitely and, and, uh, um, thank advocate for Thank you for Nami. doing that, yeah. and if you want me to come to your HST class down the road. I would love that, or yeah, we will definitely invite you. Or if you can figure out how to get somebody you. to buy five of them, I'll send you five of them. Fantastic. Because I just stumbled upon this grant. Somebody said, we need this book in the world, so thank you, Anne. It's wonderful that you're doing that. I was at the Harvest Business School, and I don't feel that the first person experience could be done in medical education yet. I was at the Harvard Business School, and they had four people with mental health conditions talking in front of the room. They don't have licenses that they could lose, right? They don't have stakes that could be brought against them, right? That's a whole other complexity that we have with licenses. But who would have thought that the Harvard Business School would have four people, and I came to you know, help, my, help them with their panel. They just invited me. They're like, hey, I think you're the lived experience guy. And I'm like, well, I'm one of them. There's many of us. But uh, I was so impressed, and I asked them about that, and they said, oh, we couldn't have done this three years ago. We've just, the, the vibe in society has changed. And I said, are you talking to the medical school? And they said, no, I don't think they're ready for us. So it's just interesting to me. It's just interesting to me. And again, that's not a slam on anything. I understand why it's more complicated for doctors and lawyers 
You have epaulets that, you know, can be removed. It's more complicated. But thank you, Anne. I'm going to ask one more question. Yeah. <clears throat> Just to follow up on the Mental Health Parity 2.0. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody, certainly in McLean Hospital, knows it's a crisis. The hospital is losing money, um, even though we are filled to capacity and yeah. there is overwhelming demand. Um, and obviously that's just not a sustainable model. Yes. And all the child and adolescent units have closed and we have a national crisis with kids Correct. boarding in emergency rooms because the there's nowhere to send them. So practically speaking, what can clinicians and patients and families who approach us and say, I want to do something, yes. what, can we, what can we actually do so to Maura try Healy to get... Now, Maura Healy's the governor. <laughs> Think about that. Maura Healy sued the health plans for violating mental health parity in her job as attorney general. Like, again, I want to emphasize this. This person is the logical force for payment fixes. She, you know, I... You know, we got a perfect score on whatever the uh, outside body was, Brad, that comes to Blue Cross, we prepare for it. We got a perfect score the same day we were cited uh, for violations of having a uh, grossly inadequate network book <laughs> where people who had died were still in the network book, the people who weren't taking patients were in the network book, people listed their names weren't taking, it was on the same day. And I got a perfect score from the, whatever the, Quality Academy is a Blue Cross, a perfect score. I never saw it before. And the same day I got a call from legal. Hey, Ken, we got a problem. Oh, we didn't get nailed for uh, mental health parity violations like all our competitors, because we fixed some things, but we were cited for having a grossly inadequate provider network that included wrong numbers, dead people, and people who aren't taking patients. So Maura Healy did that. I emphasize that because you undoubtedly have a force lobbyist. You have Scott Rausch. You have partners, you have, you still partners? We are still. You're still partners, okay. Well, MGB. Hard, hard MGB. to keep it all straight, but <laughs> you know, you're a major lobbying force. Join with NAMI Massachusetts. They just got a new executive director. You have a lawyer who knows all about this as the governor of the Commonwealth. I mean, I think this is an incredible opportunity. I real, and I don't say that to dismiss anyone before. People have done their absolute best, uh, you know, to try to work these problems. What I observed is that companies don't really like to pay for stuff. And uh, this is my fundamental takeaway from my insurance fellowship. And as you can see from my resume, I've tried to do everything you could do in the field. And uh, my takeaway was that they don't like paying for stuff. And unless there's a problem that they feel they're not motivated to increase rates. So this is why I spent so many time talking to so many CEOs about their children from all these different companies all across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and explaining that because they've underpaid, you know, through uh, the network that they're in, and if they went to a different company, it would be the same set of problems. Again, I, don't want, I want to emphasize it's not a problem with Blue Cross per se with our perfect quality score. Yeah. It was a problem of payment, but the companies have to want to pay. They have to make a decision to write checks. They have to say, we're going to... so. I think my accomplishment at Blue Cross is I got it from 6% of TME to 9% of TME. I was gunning for double digits before I left, but the idea was you shouldn't have a copay for methadone. I got rid of the copay for methadone. You shouldn't have a copay for Narcan. These things were embarrassing to me. And I don't think they were done heartlessly. I think it was thoughtless. They have a copay for this, a copay for that. It's copays. And I looked into them like, dude, why do you have a copay for Narcan? And so you can do stuff by joining organizations and making a dent inside, but I think advocacy outside. Join with NAMI Massachusetts. Join with your leadership and partners. Try to find a way to meet the governor's team. She understands mental health parity at a level that no governor in America understands. And you should not be losing money. You're the ultimate academic resource safety net facility in the Commonwealth that everybody wants to come to. I know that from many angles. So it's an excellent question, Chris. I wish there was thank an easy you. answer. I, I wish there was too. But I want to thank you on behalf of the McLean community for sharing your expertise thank you. and all of your work. And thank for you. For those so of much. you online, there's a huge crowd in the room. I just want you to know that. <laughs> thank you for having thank me, you. Chris. <laughs>